Welcome back, beautiful Tri-State area. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Up next in America's favorite pharmacist segment brought to you by Mary Ruth Organics, we're chatting with pharmaceutical expert and mega social media influencer, Phil Cowley. He's joined by Joey Thurman. Joey is a health and fitness nutrition expert and television contributor. He's the author of two books, including his newest one, The Minimum Method, The Least You Can Do to Be a Stronger, Healthier, Happier You. He's also the co-creator of the fitness app, Fun Fitness Bros. Today, they join me to chat the dangers of skinny fat. Skinny fat, also known as sarcopenia or sarcopenic obesity, is a condition in which there is a disproportionate loss of muscle mass and a corresponding increase in a person's percentage of body fat. Correlations between GLP-1 medications like Ozempic and sarcopenia should be noted. Ozempic can cause major loss of muscle mass and reduce bone density, lowering your resting metabolic rate, leading to sarcopenia. It's a a dangerous predicament to find yourself in. But don't just take my word for it. Joining me now are my experts at hand, Joey Thurman and Phil Cowley. Welcome to the show, superstars. Thank you. Hey, thank you. So, Phil, let's start with you and your extensive experience. What are the key mechanisms by which GLP-1 medications like Ozempic and Munjaro can lead to the loss of muscle mass and reduction in bone density? And could you also elaborate on the potential risks and dangers associated with such rapid weight loss? So everybody looks at these medications as being um, the answer, the cure. And they don't look at it the way they're supposed to. These medications, the terpazotide and the semaglutide, they're really great tools, but they're not the solution. And the reason why I say that is because we are seeing people lose not only fat, which is fantastic. We reduce obesity. We think, oh, they're going to live longer. But we're seeing up to a 15% reduction of lean body mass. And as we get older, that lean body mass is the only predictor of how long we live. And so when your body goes in, you has an excess of GLP-1. It does, it's non-discriminate of where it takes the fat from, um, takes the calories from. It takes an even amount from both body mass of lean muscle, as well as taking it from fat itself, meaning that you start to lose weight, but it doesn't mean that you're more healthy. And this, the other thing that GLP-1 medications do is they quite often make people very lethargic and building muscle is extremely hard while you're losing weight. You go into a saving mode and you're starting to lose a lot of calories really quickly. The last thing your body says is, hey, why don't we build muscle? You know, the risk of it's, it makes me cringe because the risk of muscle loss and sarcopenic obesity while taking the GLP ones is just one reason of many people on these medications should be under the supervision of a medical expert and supported by a nutrition expert who can ensure that they're meeting protein needs and avoiding health risks. And a lot of people just get it on the black market and, you know, take it as a weight loss drug. So for jo- Joey, how does uh, how does sarcopenic impact an individual's overall health and what role does maintaining muscle mass play in preventing this condition? And then in addition, if given your expertise, are there any specific exercise regimens or nutritional approaches that individuals on GLP-1 medications can adopt to really preserve muscle and bone density? Yeah, I mean, to you know, mirror Phil's you know, comment, yes, it's a tool. It can be a great tool. I have recommended it only to two clients when I know that they can actually implement the, the proper habits that I'm going to talk about here. And we got 300,000 people per year that break a hip. 95% of them have you know, muscle loss and do it because of a fall. So it, when you're falling, your muscles need to activate and better proprioception, basically where you are in space. Can you catch yourself? Muscles need to contract to stabilize yourself so you don't fall. You break a hip, loss of muscle, so sarcopenia, right, um, is going to lead to decreased bone density. Now, you obviously need to weight train to maintain that muscle mass. Yes, it's metabolically active, but it's also protective on your body. Think of it like a body armor as well. So yes, we need to resistance train at least two days a week if you're doing a full body workout. Get to the point where you're within like one to three reps of failure or reps in reserve, what they say, and we're not going to get into what failure is. That's a long conversation there. But you need to tax your body where that rep is slowing down. Let's say it's a bicep curl. You need to stress that to the point where that, that muscle is experiencing the hypertrophic effect or to at least maintain that muscle tissue. Now, when people get on a GLP-1, often they're not having enough protein, right? Then they're not working out because they're just using this as a crutch. 
So then you're eating less, they're eating, you know, Twinkies and donuts and everything else, which there can be a place in a regular diet for that, but you're not having your protein, you're not aware of your macronutrient and your micronutrient status, which is huge when people forget about. And then there, there's lack of sleep and everything else that's associated with it. And yes, your me metabolism will adapt, and we'll get into this later, will adapt and slow down. Your metabolism is never broken. It will slow down based off of your body weight and your metabolic rate. And even guys that are competing in bodybuilding, their testosterone levels can go down by about 75%. So think about it. If, we, if we're moving less, if we've got less muscle tissue, all of these things are just compounding and it's making us worse, even though the scale is going down. If the scale goes down, that doesn't mean you're healthier. If the scale goes up, that doesn't mean you're unhealthy. Context is king. I love what you just said. You should coin that. <laughs> Now, if you think of it in, in retrospect, resistance training mitigates all muscle loss that occurs during caloric restriction. So I, I always say it's imperative to incorporate some sort of individualized resistance training for everyone undergoing therapeutic weight loss interventions, specifically uh, these GLP ones. Now, Phil, what are the challenges in balancing the management of conditions like diabetes with the potential side effects such as sarcopenia from medications like Ozempic and Munjaro and everything we've been talking about? So this is where you really get interesting to me because you have to take something if you're diabetic. We're not talking about somebody who just needs to lose a few pounds. We're talking about somebody who will lose their feet or lose their eyes. And so these individuals, we see them as a higher risk category to begin with. And because we have that higher risk category, we put a little caveat next to their name saying, you're probably going to be taking this medication forever unless they can cure diabetes and nobody's close yet. These people are going to be taking it forever and ever. So those individuals already know that they have to be working out five days a week. Like they have to be moving. They know it because they got to keep, they have to keep their blood flow to their feet, to their eyes, to everything else. And so those individuals usually come in with the idea of here's a new tool to add to these other six tools that I have. I can't just do this and think it's over. And they're very aware of what happens in sarcopenia and what happens to their kidneys when they start spilling proteins because they break down muscle so fast. So I actually find the individuals who are diabetic are much more prepared for what is required of them and have a better expected outcome when they start taking medications like this. That's a great answer. I that you put that exactly the way, you know, it's meant to be interpreted and the individuals who are diabetic taking these medications need them as a survive survival tool, not just as another, you know, tool in the toolkit. And they are very responsible about taking them and following the right protocols surrounding that medication to your point. It's, it's the latter of the demographic that we need to be worried about. And Joey, this brings me to my next question. How can healthcare professionals and individuals find this personalized approach that addresses the medical needs, but also at the same time minimizes the risks associated with sarcopenia? Yeah, we, we need to have protocols. And I think when you have a protocol, then you've got, you've got standard optimization for everybody that's coming in. So you do regular assessments, you know, how are the uh, evaluations on their strength, on their bone density, you can do a DEXA scan. Um, I've got some stats here. They found that grip strength, this is one of the things that we really need to look at lifespan here, grip strength, which is directly associated generally when people are working out. Now, men should have a 57 pound um, grip strength and women 35 pounds. Now, if that drops down, that correlates with a higher risk of all sorts of different disease and um, less of a lifespan. So it makes sense, right? We're, we're, our bone density goes down, our grip strength goes down, we're not working out. Exercise programming, as I mentioned before, at least two days a week of resistance training, full body, preferably more. I would say if you've got one day to work out, resistance training, two days, resistance training, three days, resistance training. And you got four days, then maybe we add some cardio in there. Like we're moving. We don't stop breathing when we're lifting weights. So there, there's some cardiovascular components from that. Okay, just get your steps in. That's free. Like hit 10,000, 12,000 a day. Um, that'll help. Even if you're not active, if you're elderly, if you're looking at studies, them just moving around, if they weren't active, that will actually help build a little bit of muscle tissue and maintain the muscle tissue. And then we add some light resistance training in there. They don't need to go to full on failure because they haven't worked out in a long time. That could even be up to like eight reps before they fail out. Lifestyle modification, sleep, hunger, recovery, all that sort of stuff is going to make sense. And then you've got to go back and monitor and reassess and reevaluate over and over and over again because 
you know, you get to work out right now. You get to be healthy. You get to listen to this show and you can take these tools and implement them. And that's really going to help you along the way. So whether you're a doctor, you're a trainer, you're a nutritionist, anything like that, make sure your clients are doing this. If you've got five pounds to lose, this is not for you. If you've done everything you can and you've got hundreds of pounds to lose and you can, okay, you can get your protein around a gram per pound. I mean, we're not going to get into the caveats of that, a gram, uh, gram per pound or a gram per lean mass, if you know that, if you're fat-free mass. That's a good place to start and then get the exercise in at least two days a week of resistance training uh, and make sure we hit the legs, baby, because everybody needs legs. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. That was like the speed answer in under two minutes. I love it. Gotcha. Now, <laughs> Phil, regarding Ozempic's impact on resting metabolic rate, can you explain how Ozempic specifically affects that metabolic rate and the resting metabolic rate and why this aspect is crucial in the context of sarcopenia? Yeah, I mean, Joey answered a little bit that earlier, and I love the way that he, he did it. I always look at our bodies as like a, a car. So when we go into a resting state, instead of using all eight cylinders, our body says, oh, I only need to use four. Well, that four cylinders, when we use it, the car burns less gas, and that gas equivalates out to our, met, our met, metabolic state. When we start building lean muscle, let's just say you start hitting the gym three days a week, and you do what you can do. Now, every time you get up and move, you move all those muscles. So instead of just using four cylinders, you've moved to eight cylinders, meaning that your body says, hey, if I'm going to move, I'm going to kick in more and that muscle is going to make me burn more. So you'll find somebody who starts out with Ozempic burning 1800 calories a day. But by the time that they're done dropping all the weight they are, now they're only burning 1200, but they're still used to eating that 1800. So they come off of the Ozempic don't have those extra muscles that have burned that extra energy. And then they go back to the 1800. Now you're gaining 600 calories a day just because you've lost so much lean muscle mass. And so the more muscle you have engaged, even when you just pick up a jar of, of pickles will increase the way that your metabolism work. When you sleep, how feel, how you feel your, you know, your thermal dynamics will tell you a lot. People who lose a lot of weight all of a sudden are cold out of, out of nowhere. All of those things lean to loss of muscle mass and loss of muscle mass, again, is the highest place to look at on longevity of life. You lose muscle loss, you die younger. Wow. That just hit straight close to home because at this point, even people that are not overweight should heed the warning because it's all about muscle mass. Now, Joey, from a fitness and nutrition standpoint, how can individuals manage their metabolic rate to mitigate the risks of muscle mass loss, which seems to be the big culprit here. Yeah, I'm going to try to answer this in about a minute and a half. So let's rem remember shreds, biofeedback, sleep, hunger, recovery, energy, digestion, stress. Think about that right there. Um, as part of one of my certifications, I'm a fit, uh, functional nutrition metabolism specialist. So we, we look at this, your, your sleep has to be absolutely on point, whether that's you're getting six hours a day um, or eight hours a day, make sure it's consistent, consistent times. Hunger, managing your hunger. If you're hungry all of the time, um, you're you're going to probably binge, overeat, undereat, those sort of things. If you're if you're on a GLP one, you need to be aware of that and be aware of the food that you're getting. So a good tool that I use, I'm not paid for, but I'll take money if they wanted to. Uh, yeah. chrono, chronometer, like you, you you can track your micronutrients, your macronutrient status, and see if you're lacking B, manganese, uh, iodine, all these things that are metabolically active. Recovery, are you sleeping enough? Are you recovering between sets enough? Are you Burning the candle at both ends. Are you doing too many hit classes where cortisol levels is chronically elevated? Cortisol is a good thing. Everybody thinks cortisol is bad. It's, it's a hormone for a reason. We have it. Um, there's no accidental hormones. Uh, energy. How is your energy? Are, are you sleeping enough? Are all these things beforehand affecting you? Digestion. Are the foods you're eating affecting it? Your digestion is going to slow down on something like this. So what can you handle? What can you digest? I have a client that I just have him doing smoothies and greens and fruit because he can't eat enough, but it's getting his macronutrients and micronutrients just from blending it together. And stress. How are you managing that stress? Whether that's sleep, whether that's work stress, whether that's life stress, whether that's an acute stressor. Um, are you doing breathing tactics, you know, box breathing, um, physiological size? All these things can affect your metabolic rate and how your body is working together like a car. As Phil said, our body's a system. It needs to work together and fire on all cylinders. 
Wow. Yeah, that's exactly right. And when when I as a mom, I'm always advocating for, you know, make sure we're getting the right amount of sleep because I'm always advocating for optimal circadian patterns and optimal circadian patterns of these hormones can also contribute to, you know, a healthier body composition, like you said. And conversely, sleep deprivation can lead to increased levels of your hunger hormone, causing more food cravings. So it all ties back to just having your car run like a well-oiled machine, no pun intended. Now, Phil, can healthcare professionals and influencers like yourself and Joey contribute to raising awareness about the potential dangers of skinny fat and, and the specific risks associated with these medications? Because I feel like the medical professionals are not attacking the this conversation as aggressively as influencers and health experts are. The doctors seem to have taken a step back here. Doctors like to use um, evidence-based medicine, and they kind of stay within that range, which isn't an, a problem, generally speaking, but it's just a little bit short-sighted. When you have a medication that realistically have been used by the populace now in the way that we are for, what, two, three years, they haven't had time to gather the information that they need. We don't know what somebody who's been on Ozempic or on Manjaro looks like in 15 years because they don't exist. And so we have even started to look at the sarcopenic category of individuals, especially those in their later years. You know, you start somebody who is overweight when they're 62 and they're already losing lean body mass and they drop a lot of weight and we think this will be great. And they take all of the information they have and they have extrapolated that from obesity rates. So if we reduce obesity rates naturally, they live longer. Well, we're reducing obesity rates, but not in a way that's ever been seen before. So they're extrapolating out two pieces of data. The data first is they're losing weight. So we think this is what's going to happen, but we only think that because of these other studies. And so the reason why people like Joey and myself are seeing it is because I'm seeing patients not performing the way you would expect with somebody who normally lose weight through exercise. Those people look different. They are healthier. You see them moving more. Whereas now what you're seeing is patients that almost look like chemotherapy patients. They come in, it's like they've lost everything and you're starting from scratch. So it sets off alarms for people like Joey and myself. We're like, okay, this isn't normal weight loss. Something else has happened here. And this is a mess. I mean, this is going to take me months to help them get back to where they're at. And so I think the reason why you're seeing it is the hands-on approach versus the data-based approach. And in 10 years, the doctors will be saying the exact same thing that we're saying now. They, it just takes them a while to get the data. Well, that's another great answer. And you're right. You you put things into perspective exactly the way that, you know, America sees things, right? They wait for the doctors to come in. The CDC hands them the reports. The doctors react. Same thing with the FDA. This is a vicious cycle because in the in the in the interim, you're left to pick up pick up the pieces of the puzzle and help everybody coming to the pharmacy and Joey coming to him for, you know, to get back into into shape. Well, we are at the end of a great, great segment. Joey, thank you so much for coming on. Phil, always a pleasure to chat with you. You are one of our regular contributors and one of the most popular at this point. Well, thank you, Joey. This was awesome. You made it, made it so easy. It was so much fun. Oh, uh, you know, you're easy, man. All in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, it's very important to educate both healthcare providers and the general public about making informed choices regarding medications and their impact on body composition. That was America's Favorite Pharmacist segment brought to you by Mary Ruth Organics. And that was the incredible pharmaceutical expert, mega social media influencer, Phil Cali, with joined by our dear friend, Joey Thurman. Joey's a health fitness nutrition expert and television contributor. You definitely have to check out his book, The Minimum Method, The Least You Can Do to Be a Stronger, Healthier, Happier You. And check out his really fun app. He co-created it. It's called The Fun Fitness Bros. Check him out on the gram at Joey Thurman Fit. And check out Phil at Phil's My Pharmacist. Do check out the incredible supplements at MaryRuthOrganics.com. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Mary Ruth's Organics. Not all supplements are alike. Mary Ruth's believes that making the best supplements means creating products that are only made out of the highest quality ingredients. They are non-GMO, plant-based, vegan, and they taste great. Mary Ruth's Organics assist in maintaining your health and aid your body on your way to wellness. For more information, go to MaryRuthOrganics.com and use the promo code PHIL20MRO for 30% discount off your first order. That's MaryRuthOrganics.com. Um...